All right. I think we can go ahead and get started here. Um, it says the webinar has started, so it feels very official, Alan. So I feel like we should get started. Sounds good. Uh, I just want to go ahead and uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, we are doing a uh, barrier breaker session uh, with uh, Alan Cow, uh, who is uh, a film and TV licensing manager uh, for BMG Music. Uh, Alan is a multiple uh, degree uh, alumni of the school, the LA Film School of the Recording School. He's also a military veteran as well. So first and foremost, obviously, we thank him for his service with us. And we're really appreciative uh, that he's joining us uh, today. So thank you so much for joining us, Alan. Really good to meet you and talk to you today and share some of your insight and your experience with uh, current students, recent graduates, and potential students as well. Uh, so just a couple of uh, ground rules before uh, we get started. Uh, I'm going to read this. Uh, I apologize if, if I messed this up, but uh, if you can go ahead, everyone on, if you're listening on YouTube or another platform, if you can go ahead and just leave your mic muted and submit questions via the chat, and we're going to do our best to answer those as much as possible. Uh, we will be having a Q and a session at the end. Uh, so please do uh, put your questions in the chat. And like I said, we'll do our best to get to those. Just as a reminder, we are going to be recording uh, the event as well. Uh, and again, uh, thank you so much uh, for our alumni, Alan Cow, for being with us. We do really appreciate your time. You know, it's very valuable, and we do really appreciate that. Um, okay. So, uh, and, and, I'm, and by the way, I'm Mac Trilluccio. I'm the Senior Program Director for the Entertainment Business Program, both campus and online. Uh, I've been with the LA Film School uh, in December. will be about four years, uh, and I always oversee all uh, program, or excuse me, all program and curriculum as it relates to entertainment business for both campus and online, and as well as our uh, music business program that is based online as well. Uh, so Alan, uh, I was wondering if you could just go ahead and just kind of start off uh, just telling us a little bit about yourself, uh, perhaps where you're originally from, just a little bit of bio of information, and then kind of how you wound up uh, at the LA Film School, LA Recording School. Um, yeah, sure. Um, I grew up in the South Bay area, Torrance, California, so pretty L.A. Um, I think like right out of high school, I just realized I just was too immature for college, didn't know what I wanted to do and didn't want to really want to waste time. So I joined the Air Force, ended up doing air traffic control there for six years, enjoyed my time doing it. Um, I did one tour to Iraq. I think 09 or something like that got out right after that and I was like I don't want to do air traffic control right now kind of started looking in other directions of like where I wanted to start a career you know I was a band nerd in high school middle school whatnot so and I live in LA so like music kind of made sense and that's when um I started taking advantage of my military benefits we have a GI bill that's pretty good and you should take definitely take advantage of where you get like housing allowance so like it makes going to school much doable without like having like an extra job on the side and whatnot and then so the first program I did was the engineering program I think you know playing guitar and like being interested in electronic music it kind of made sense to go that route like once I started like messing around with pedals I was like I don't know what signal flow is whatnot you know so i got my education there graduated that and i think i started doing studio like gigs like afterwards i'm not i'm trying to think the order of my <laughs> my resume here uh, i think i started working at a, a management company where they manage artists like the cataracts and like dev and carnage and whatnot and i started doing tracking sessions there for a while then I moved, then I think I went to the music production program because uh, money was tight, you know, and uh, <laughs> the music industry can be tough with all the interning and whatnot and not getting the hours you need. Did the music production thing, just uh, get that BAH going again. And then I think I started working at Record Plant Studios as a runner, which, which I eventually became like a part-time assistant engineer there. 
then after a couple of years at the record plant, I went back to school for the business program. Just just because the studio life was fun, but it was kind of tough. And I didn't know with like technology these days, how everyone can like record at home these days, like how much of a future engineers really have at the time. So I was like, let me study the music industry a little bit more and see what avenues I might go down. Then, so while I was in the business school, I had a class, I think it was like an intellectual property class. And that's when I learned about music licensing and all these laws when it comes to music and uh, TV syncs and whatnot. And that's when I started pursuing uh, trying to be a music supervisor or work on the clearance side. And that's why I work today. Got it. A lot of interesting uh, parallels, not only uh, with, with you, but also with, you know, students that I've seen uh, myself as well. Uh, and, and students who are kind of starting out at the L.A. Film School and L.A. Recording School um, in terms of, you know, for example, myself, uh, I was kind of classically trained in uh, television production and film production. And I went to school for that. But it really took me going out to Los Angeles and learning a little bit more about the business of entertainment, uh, the, the, the show business side of things and how things operated uh, to really realize, like, I actually enjoyed that more uh, in so, terms of, you know, being involved in the physicality of it happens a lot uh, with film students, happens a lot with music students. Uh, do you feel like, you know, for yourself, that was something that was a little bit more necessity or like, you know, as you're sitting right now, I mean, obviously, I'm sure you're doing things on the side as well, but mm -hmm. you have a nine to five. Do you feel like ultimately that's, you know, kind of the path that you, you want to be on and, and that was ultimately a better fit for you? I would, yeah, I wouldn't say it was like 100% a necessity, but like I did have an interest for sure to go the more, not necessarily nine to five route, but a business route instead of just, uh, you know, doing those 12 hour studio shifts over and over again, you know, waiting for right. that big break. Right. Which is a very real thing, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, one of our programs, we have our, a completer program in entertainment business, and uh, there's a lot of students who come out of the recording school just as yourself, and they say very similar things, wherein they've wanted to get that understanding of it, they get, they gain that understanding of it, but ultimately they feel like they maybe want to going want, want to be going in a different direction in terms of their career, which is totally totally okay. It's totally fine. Hollywood is you know film filled with pivots you know every day of the week in in terms of. Uh, in terms of careers and journeys we're at an interesting point right now where in, in hollywood and entertainment uh the swiss the swiss army knife is more valuable uh, than ever before you have to have a lot of skill sets uh with regards to to the industries that you're you're interested in um you mentioned a couple things and i'm looking at your resume as well uh that you did some internships uh can you talk a little bit about that if you did that during your time did you do that afterwards and kind of how that impacted uh, where you're at now with your knowledge and your skill set? It was a little bit of both. It was during school and some outside of school. I mean, I did go back to school three times or whatever <laughs> it is. But, uh, you know, I'm just a bit believer of, like, placing yourself in places to succeed. You know, like, you're wasting time pretty much if you're not at least trying to do that. You know, like, to the path where I got to was all through networking. You know, like what you know versus who you know i mean it's like one of those debates right it's it's pretty much a who you know world and um and i realized that early, early on in my career so like i definitely took advantage of that yeah really really valuable uh advice you know we kind of preach that in terms of experiential learning and and getting internships uh i myself do that as well many of our students do that but you know it, to a certain degree there's only so much that a classroom environment can teach you and you really do have to get into those real world, you know, real world practical uh, environments to really understand what's happening now. But then also, you know, like we talked about to realize like, well, this might be something I'm actually interested in that you may have not learned about uh, in, in your in your degree plan. As it currently, you know, sits right now in our entertainment business, music business program, a lot of the areas that you talked about, a &R, music supervision, music licensing, music business law, things of that nature, those are actually, since you've been with the school, those are actually things that we've started to develop in recognition of, you know, trying to build out a well-rounded music business executive. And what does that mean? And what does that look like? Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, how you, you know, you mentioned internships. 
uh, and you mentioned a little bit about your past, but in terms of like, okay, now I'm graduating. Now I'm actually, you know, going out there and I have to get this thing called a job and, and what that means. Can you talk a little bit about your experience and, and how that went for you and things of that nature? Like to get the current gig I'm in right now, I think before I was at a, like a music editing place, I was like just interning there, um, like pretty much to get like the Rolodex to music supervisors. Like they worked on all like the TV productions and whatnot, you know, and I did some music editing there as well because I had the engineering background. So like I was able to assist that way. But then I started meeting music supervisors and I literally started cold calling them, taking them out to coffee. And I was been pretty much asking them for jobs. And then I met this one music supervisor, Ann Klein, and uh, she had no openings for me, but she liked my spirit. She liked my resume and she recommended to be the job at BMD. Wow, that's fantastic. So you literally were just like cold calling, like almost like a salesperson and reaching out to these people. And, and were they receptive to that for the most part? Yeah, for the most part, um, because it's like, I don't know. People are nicer than you think. You know, I mean, of course, they got some that were ignores, but like they're just like, hey, this guy, they probably see a little bit of themselves in me. They're like, hey, he's starting in the industry, you know, take some guts to like do this, you know, not to the point of like annoyance. I'm not like following up every single day, but it's like you gotta shoot your shot. Right. 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 You, you shouldn't. Uh, I've had a few students be a little bit anxious where they literally put on their nice suit or their nice dress and they'll show up to the front office and the front door, <laughs> maybe not do that, but, but yeah. uh, what you're actually preaching about is, is creating networks and, and utilizing your contacts and kind of maximizing mm -hmm. that. That's, you know, really, really great advice in terms of seeking out what you want to obtain in terms of, uh, you know, getting a job. Do, are there people that you still talk to from, from when you were doing that, that are still uh, in your network, would you say? Yeah. I send Christmas cards or like, you know, a little, coffee card you know and be like hey i remember what you did for me you know that's awesome that's something uh that's a, a tried and true hollywood uh thing that happens all the time that's that's a great thing that you do because it is yeah. just those little things that people pick up on whether it's doing an interview or having a general meeting sending a thank you note after the fact or doing something like that annually uh it really does go a long way that's uh that's pretty great to hear um, can you talk a little bit about uh, your experience, uh, you know, in the military, you know, kind of what that meant to you? And, and you know, I, I'm always kind of curious with, with military veterans in terms of like, you know, what were you thinking about going into it in terms of like, okay, when I'm done, I want to pursue this from an educational perspective. Uh, and then also kind of like, you know, things that you may have learned in the military you know, skills or trades or anything like that, that you potentially could apply later on down the road? Um, I mean, professionalism for sure. Oh, well, let me start. When I went to the military, I already knew I was getting out. You know, I was going in there for the benefits and I was aware of them, you know. So I, I, I viewed it as me going to college, you know. Um, in the military, it definitely matured me quick, <laughs> quick. And uh, professionalism and the way you communicate with others being punctual, like all that, like has assisted me in getting to where I am today for sure. And then air traffic control, when it comes to like my specific job, definitely helped me learn how to use my brain, if that makes sense. <laughs> A lot of the jobs I got, people ignored all my other like entertainment uh, parts of my resume. And they're like, all right, air traffic control, how did you learn how to do that? If you can do this, you can do my job easily, you know? Right, so, right. Yeah. I, I, and, you know, and we were talking about it before and, you know, we'll bring it to, to everyone here. I, you know, I, I have experience. I started out, you know, there's a lot of things that you learn in school and there's a lot of things that you just don't learn. Like I said, that you need experiential learning. And one of my first experiences uh, working in Hollywood, I worked for a production company and I worked by, I worked for a guy by the name of Al Ruddy, who won the Oscar. He won two Oscars, but he won the Oscar at the time for producing The Godfather, arguably one of the most famous movies, if not the most famous movie ever made. So talk about intimidating. Uh, and there was no class that I took that was, you know, a topic about how do you work with an Oscar winner or something like oh, that? Yeah. You know, will you ever be good enough? Will you ever be, you know, professional enough? And then after I left there, I wound up going to Creative Artists Agency and I worked at a talent agency 
And uh, I always joked, and, and this is serious proof, but I always joked about it when people would ask me, you know, is it really, you know, as bad as they say, or as nuts or as wild or anything like that? And I would always answer the same way. I would say, you know, well, it is what you, you know, you make out of it. Uh, yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a challenging environment, but you have to be willing to accept that. And you have to be up to the challenge. You have to want to do it. Because ultimately, if you're not interested in it, you're never going to enjoy it. You really have to kind of be passionate about it. But I would literally say to people, you know, I've never been one, but I kind of equate it to being like an air traffic controller where, you know, at any moment you could be getting hit up with a piece of instant communication from a client who's upset about a payment or upset about a project, mm. or you could get an email from your boss who's four feet away from me and doesn't need to email you. They could just walk up to you or you can get in, be getting this thing called a phone call. I know a lot of people don't use the phone as much anymore, but the phone actually would ring incessantly. And someone always wants something and they always want it yesterday in Hollywood. They don't want it now. They want it the day before. And, uh, you know, I, I and I'm amazed by it, you know, by, by stuff like that, because it's a very, very responsible position that you had, you know, and I don't know how old you were, but you definitely weren't 50 years old when you did it. I know that, you know, yeah. and in Hollywood, it kind of operates like that, too. And those in, in entry level positions at an agency, per se, sometimes you're thrown into it. And you wonder, like, why are they giving these responsibilities to 23 year olds? Are they sure you want to do this? Like you want to be responsible for that. But did you feel, you know, comfortable? Were you not intimidated by anything? You feel like based on that experience, you know, doing something like that? Uh, yeah, I think that definitely helped. And I, and I agree with what you're saying. Like I joke all the time that like I got hired not because of my knowledge, but because I can deal with people in certain like fire situations like they understand that like hey he's not gonna talk bad about a client even though like maybe something went wrong on our end you know like they understand that i can handle myself in a high client profile like situation Does that makes sense it does it does yeah. now i have one top gun nerd joke and that's it uh what was the largest plane that you ever helped land it's got to be a c5 a C5. I don't yeah. know what a C5 is. What yeah, yeah. can you tell me what a C5 it's is? It's a outdated cargo plane. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. You don't do that every day. Well, you yeah. did every day, but we don't do that every day. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about um then kind of like, you know, obviously uh interning and then working uh actual jobs in, in kind of like the engineering world? Is there anything that you would say uh, you worked at Stag Studios, you work at the record plant, which obviously is is one of the most well-known recording yeah. studios around. Is there anything that you would say based on the physicality that you eventually kind of parlayed into more of the business side of things of what you're currently doing right now? I think when I was doing the engineering stuff, um, my mind wasn't 100% there yet. Like when it came to like the business side, I was still like definitely in the grind a little bit in shock with all the celebrities I saw like on a daily basis, you know, like, um, and it's just like the graveyard shift grind, you know, just like hanging with other engineer boys. It wasn't until like the tail end when I was like, maybe the industry's changing a little bit because of the, like I said earlier with tech technology and like everyone just recording uh, at home you know, and there wasn't a lot more opportunities for like an engineer to get picked up, you know, and be like a, an artist engineer or whatever that follows them around. And, you know, it's tough, you know, like the hourly wages for runners and assistant engineers, you know, like living in LA is tough. So that's why I wanted to do the, the business program to figure something else out. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And are, are there things that you still reference to this day in terms of like that experience? Or are you, you know, totally in the kind of in the other side of things, you know, from from engineering into like being more in the business side of things? What do you mean like reference? Like, do I like still remember the war stories of like? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I'm sure you won't. Forget, I'm sure you won't forget those. But just more in terms of like the skill sets and like, you know, in, in terms of like, you know, the, the physical musicality of things. Like dealing with clients, probably it's probably the biggest thing. And that was like something that. Um, I wasn't too happy with uh, when I initially got out of the engineering program is not realizing how to 
deal with clients like in a writing session. Like uh, when I went through, it was a pretty new program and I'm pretty sure it's fixed up and all good to go. You know, I mean, cause when I went back to production, I was like, oh, this is like a lot better of, it, of an experience, but like dealing with clients and yeah, it's probably the, the biggest thing that enge- the engineering like experience taught me. Right. And then, you know, obviously the client is never wrong. We yeah, know that exactly. regardless, regardless yeah. of uh, what area we're, we're dealing with, yeah. you know, and also, you know, for those of you that could be interested in, uh, you know, on the business side of things, whether it's music or film or content or television or whatever it may be, you know, that never goes away. There's always going to be a client. Um, and, and also, uh, if you go to the selling side of things and you work at a management company or you work at a, a talent agency, there are going to be uh, clients who are working more than the others uh, or they haven't done something in a very, very long time. And you're always kind of, you know, figuring it out and balancing uh, those egos and those reputations and, and things of that nature. I literally used to have people um, who made some of the most well-known content you've ever heard of who would call me on a daily basis and say, yeah, you know, don't put me on hold. Don't you know the movies that I've made? And I said, I do but I need to put you on hold because uh, this is a telephone call. It's not uh, the same <laughs> as a meeting, but, uh, and, and that kind of never goes away. And I think the, those types of skills, you know, uh, uh, definitely what you're talking about, networking, contacts, people skills, those hard skills are, are incredibly, in, not only the, the intangibles, but they're incredibly uh, invaluable as well. I agree. Uh, now uh, let's kind of, you know, jump a little bit ahead uh, in terms of, you know, kind of currently uh, where you're at. Can you talk a little bit about uh, BMG um, and also kind of talk about, you know, their history? Now, I'm a thousand years old. You may know this. I'm guessing you know this because you work there, but but not that I'm a thousand years old, but I'm a thousand years old. And and correct me if I'm wrong, a million years ago when there was these things called compact discs, yeah, yeah. CDs, there used to be these music clubs and things like that called Columbia House, which is Sony. And then I think there was a BMG one. Have you ever heard of? Anything related to, to any of these? Yes. Um, so, so the BMG was a part of Sony back in the day, you know, dinosaur age. And but the BMG I work for is a, a restarted company, so completely separate from Sony. Got it. Got yeah, it. yeah. And uh, are they are they owned currently by by anyone, or are they an international company, or how's that? Yeah, it's a German work? company owned by the Bertelsmann Group. Right, and Bertelsmann yeah. is wine and spirits. Am I correct? I believe so. Yeah. Yes. So if you want some music or you want to have a cold beer, <laughs> go to BMG. Alan has everything for you. Fantastic. <laughs> now, uh, did you go uh, when you joined up with uh, 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 BMG? Uh, was this like a, a long process in terms of like, did you begin entry level? Did you start off as a manager? Can you talk a little bit about how that process worked in terms of you joining up with them? I started as a temp, actually. Because I think I got hired around like the fourth quarter. And usually like a lot of companies will hire temps in the fourth quarter just because it's like, you know, end of the year, we need to hit our targets, whatnot. We need the extra manpower to get like money through the door. So I started that as a temp, but I kind of knew I was going to, the coordinator position was going to open up in the, in the following year. So I was like, even though I had to re-interview for it, I kind of knew I was going to get that coordinator gig. Um, yeah, so I started entry level, started as a coordinator. I started on the admin side. So I was processing licenses and stuff like that, setting it up in the system for our issuers to send out and invoice, uh, clients for, for the money, you know? And then after maybe six months of that, I was in a position where they're like, do you want to be on the clearance negotiation side? And that's when I made the, the switch. Not like I, not because I didn't like the admin side, but on the clearance negotiation side, all the clients like came to me, you know, I'm like handed a, like a list of clients and networking has never been easier. I don't have to go out and like find them. They're literally just walking up to my like front step because BMG has a pretty good pub and master catalog, you know. Compared to other like pub houses or whatever, you know, like where maybe you have to go and reach out to ESPN to use my music. Like ESPN comes to me to use the music we have. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's an it's an incoming business. And for Clary, we're not talking about a bar. We're talking about publishing. <laughs> <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> so, um, now, 
fascinating, by the way, because this is something that we talk about uh, a lot and I've talked about, you know, in, in different capacities. Now, we're uh, specifically, were you, did you join up as a temp with an external agency that had a, a relationship with BMG or were you literally hired by BMG as, as a temp environment? Uh, no, I was hired directly by BMG because of my um, music supervisor cold calling story. Right. Got yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. Because sometimes, you know, uh, and, and I experienced this at multiple companies, uh, we would do two things. One, uh, at an agency side management company, especially the large, large ones, if you do not, if you apply to be an inter- or excuse me, if you apply to be an assistant and you do not get hired as an assistant position, you could potentially be hired in, a, in what they call a floater position, which is basically if you're out sick, if you're on vacation, someone can come in and float for you and kind of work on that desk mm-hmm. and they become utility players. Yeah, uh, friends that did that. Yeah, and one of my one of my my one of my earliest friends in entertainment, he was one of the worst assistants I've ever seen in my life at CAA, but an amazing writer, and he went on to write a bunch of great Hollywood blockbusters, and he's still writing to this day. But he made his early connections working in that agency landscape as a floater, going around from you know on a Monday on a film desk, Tuesday on a talent desk, Thursday on a law desk, and and so on and so forth. Uh, but that happens all the time. I would see that happen all the time. Uh, at Disney, they would bring in temps uh, who would be offered an opportunity for two weeks or four weeks or, you know, eight weeks or something like that. And then based on how well they performed and clearly, you know, you perform well, opportunities kind of presented uh, themselves. Now, did you have to uh, interview again when you made that next step when you were officially, officially on or was it kind of I a did. transition? I did. Um, I think that's just like maybe a formality. But uh, yeah, I had a re-interview. Um, I mean, because the job was sli- also slightly different, so they wanted to make sure, like, as a reminder, they're like, "Can you do this job?" Like, <laughs> you know, type thing. But I did want to mention that, like, like how I got that gig. A lot of these gigs aren't open to the public, and you won't see it. Like a lot of times, when something opens up, they just send it up amongst their like their other colleagues that they've met in the industry. So you might not even hear about the job, you know, unless they get desperate enough, then they open it up to LinkedIn. So work on that network. Yeah, definitely network. And, and, and the other side too, is that sometimes it gets filled so fast that yeah, you, know, yeah, you, yeah, 100%, yeah. you really have to be available, like within the day, you know, within the moment to interview. And that goes for anything from being a PA, you know, mm-hmm. all the way uh, to the, to the business side of things. Um, and uh, now you, you mentioned, uh, you know, in terms of dealing with clients and some financials, things like that. Can you kind of just, you know, give us a general landscape in terms of like, you know, what your day to day is and what it kind of means for you to be a manager of film and TV licensing, you know, at BMG in terms of the clients, uh, you know, the externals that are coming to you looking for licensing and so on and so forth. Um, I wake up, I cry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, Me day too. To day. <laughs> Me too. It's all good. Yeah. Um, day to day um first like i open my inbox and i see like 900 emails right and then i got to check out my priority clients um so i so the stuff i work i work in the video games a lot uh i work with sports um i work on scripted tv and promos not so much film but i can handle film from here to there and sometimes like if my music supervisor that i'm assigned to or like has it works on a film, I'll work on the film. But for the most part, TV, sports, and video games. Um, in the morning, I'll check my inbox and start finding the fires because there's always going to be a fire. There's some, there's some deadline like, oh, they're, they're reshooting this because uh, they found out it was an uncleared sample in this one hip-hop track, and we need to find another song. We need to clear this by like two hours. So I start with those, you know, and then I start working down my priority clients and by the end of the day you know i'll see how much time i have and try and help out on a student film or two you know <laughs> oh so you'll so you'll get those queries too just like a general yeah, yeah, yeah. oh wow and that yeah. it runs the gamut from hey can you help uh paramount needs to make a new godfather video mm-hmm. game to can you help out an independent student film that's pretty cool that's yeah. really cool i'm now working my way out of those deals a little bit as i'm moving up the ranks but yeah i still get a i still get a couple of those for sure well i think you're trying to give back just like the person who decided to have coffee with you right it's it's one hand washes the air you i I, the other it's it's keeping good karma and good energy i hear you completely 
Now, uh, you mentioned a uh, music supervisor. So now are you, you assigned under like an umbrella of supervisors? Is that ultimately something you want to become? Is that kind of that track or am I correct on that? Yeah, I definitely want to be a music supervisor someday, you know, but when I was at um, Metal Man Music, this is a music supervision like trio of uh, Kevin Elliman and like, Andy Gowan and stuff like that. They worked on huge shows like It's Always Sunny and whatnot. Um, I learned that you can't really taste make sometimes if the budget's not there. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like I, if I was at a smaller music supervision company, it's, I wouldn't really do, be doing what I think is music supervising. You know, I'm like finding the best songs for the budget, you know, which is still a talent in itself and you're still, you're still taste making. But I was just like, you know what, I'm a stay on the clearance side for like maybe a little bit more and then I'll dabble that in that uh, part of the industry, like maybe in a couple of years, you know, that's my plan. Right. And can you talk a little bit about just some of the, you know, you know, well-known clients or if you're able to talk about like any, like, you know, well-known big experiences or anything like that, that you were kind of involved with, uh, with regards to, to clients or NBMG or anything like that? Um, yeah. I mean, like I've cleared like Super Bowl spots, you know, I worked on like a Guy Ritchie film. I don't even know if it's out yet, to be honest. Um, uh, I did a pretty big sync in uh, Succession using a Nirvana song that he's raped me. Um, that was and, you. Yeah, that was you. Okay. I I, yeah, I heard it's like one of the most iconic syncs like in, in a while. I haven't seen yeah. it myself, but yeah. Yeah. Now, is that um, because of you all with Nirvana? Is that how that Yeah, works? Nirvana's with BMG, the publishing right. side anyway. Did you do the, um, wasn't there a trailer? Didn't someone use it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's in the Batman, which is the a Batman. recent, a, yeah, the, but I didn't, I didn't clear that deal. Got it. Got yeah, it. Yeah. That was a big deal too. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's a band where, you know, I can't even believe that we're talking about this, which makes me even 2000 years old, yeah. but, uh, you know, they're at that point right now. Um, yeah. what, would you say that, you know, in terms of like clients, like, you know, in that relationship, is and you mentioned your thousand emails every day and Kanye how do you sort through that and sift yeah, through yeah. all that are there you know in terms of prioritizing and things like that are there things that you just naturally have to do like you know the biggest names and things of that nature that you have to kind of focus your attention on like immediately as opposed to like other things of course like ESPN's a huge client of mine um their fees are like on the lower end because it's like they, they, they license a lot of music. So like, they're not, you know, paying so much for everything. And most people want the sports look, you know? So like, that's a client that um, I definitely focus on a lot. Like I'll pick up phone calls on the weekend for, you know, type thing, you know, <laughs> which I try really hard not to do, you know? And, and I suggest no one else do that as well because like you gotta keep a good mental on yourself. Right. Turn your phone off unless it's ESPN on the weekend. Yeah, that yeah, makes yeah, sense yeah, to me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and in terms of what, like, wh what are they, you know, obviously they're pushing out so much more original content yeah. than ever before. Are we talking about their spots? Are we talking about their shows? It is everything. Well, like, let's say I ruined the relationship between BMG and ESPN and they don't want to use any more BMG music because, like, they're holding a grudge. Like, I'm gone. You know what I mean? If that gets back to my boss, you know. There you go. Yeah. And uh, in terms of, you know, obviously, you know, the gaming industry is, you know, growing more and more, you know, every single year, who knows even the total value of it. But is that something that is, you know, is it keeping steady? Is it exploding? Is it growing gradually in terms of your experience? In I mean, soon? the video game industry is not dying anytime soon, for sure. You know, so they definitely have the money. Um, like I work, like work on Just Dance with uh, Ubisoft, you know, like they're a great client of mine. Um, but it's confusing and there's a lot of territories that haven't been mapped out yet. If that, like when it comes to video games and the metaverse and the Roblox and the Fortnite, like concerts and what it's all, it's, it's a new media. So like the whole industry is figuring it out right now. And I'm guessing you're referencing in terms of like, okay, you can license it for X but you think you've licensed it for a lot of, you know, Y, Z, and A, but you actually haven't done that. Is that what you're kind of referencing? Yeah, it's, it's, 
there's a lot of gray area when it comes to video games right now, for sure. And well, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. When when it comes to like metaverse stuff, you know, um, maybe like the FIFA and the Maddens, where they have like a soundtrack. Those are a little bit more cut and dry, where it's more similar to TV, but other video games coming out right now are a little bit different. Well, if anyone's heard of a couple of these little companies, one is called uh, Big Red, a.k.a. the electric company, a.k.a. Netflix. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then the other one is, you know, Amazon and Amazon Prime, where, you know, I've got two young kids. We would buy clothes for the kids and we would also watch Prime videos, you know, across the board. (laughs) But when they started out, uh, I don't want to say that they were kind of, you know, duping the industry. But keep in mind, streaming is less than 30 years old. Mm -hmm. Right. And. when Netflix began, it was a physical DVD company, then, then decided to get into original content. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, first they did uh, licensing of libraries and then original content. Mm-hmm. Problem was, is that much to like what you're talking about, and this is something we talk about in all of our, our classes, IP, entertainment business law, and uh, artist management, and so on and so forth, uh, the unions and the guilds and the laws are way behind. Mm -hmm. And we're way behind. So when Netflix and Amazon began, they technically, they technically classified themselves as digital companies. They didn't view themselves as brick and mortar studios and networks. So for example, early Netflix, when you're watching friends and you're streaming it over and over again, yes, the friends, you know, may have gotten six Porsches from Warner brothers television to celebrate their landmark bajillion episodes, but they were not getting paid residuals for the billions of times that people were restreaming on whichever platform uh, you want to pick. And they were getting the traditional distribution royalties as it relates to like, you know, uh, uh, cable television, the TNTs and the TBSs of the world. That's why those, those, those massive deals for a Seinfeld or friends or any large show that you can kind of think of, especially sitcoms. But then when they, put that into the digital age and streaming and stuff like that, we're now pushing into a landscape where, for example, that's why Scarlett Johansson is going after Disney plus her black widow. Like, okay, well you paid me. Not only did you pay me less because I'm not a male, but you're not paying me for all of these, what you classify as ancillary revenue streams. And they're not, they're primary revenue streams and they're not, they're simply not compensating uh, them. I I'm guaranteeing well, I don't want to say guarantee, but I would I would gather that I'm pretty sure that that is happening with music too. Wherein, if they license a song for Friends episode 1998, and then it's streamed over and over again, those musicians are not getting paid. Is that kind of like a fair version of that to say? No comment. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'll pre- I I'll take your no comment mm-hmm. with, without a doubt. But I totally understand it. But it's something that is happening all the time. You know, in the news today was. You know, George Lopez, for example, is doing the same exact thing uh, with with relation to comedy and and Pandora and things like that. But it's a very, very valid thing, you know, that's happening. But hopefully it all gets uh, resolved in that in that landscape. Uh, can you talk a little bit about in terms of where you feel uh, you're ultimately going to be going in terms of like staying on this side of things, uh, you know, keeping in, in, in music licensing, things of that nature? Do you feel like that's where you're you ultimately want to progress in? Yeah, I mean, eventually I do want to like dabble in the music supervision role, but the clearance part and the business side of of music is very, still very, very interesting to me. And I've always been a person that like, if it doesn't keep my interest, like I'm moving on, to be honest, you know, so I'm definitely enjoying it here at BMG for the time being. But uh, yeah, we'll see in in the future. But for now, I I'm still very, very interested because like that's why I'm working in video games is because it's so interesting. You know, I'm just like, what is this? You know, like I need a law degree to read these clear, like these contracts. <laughs> you know, it's like that. Right. No, without a doubt. Mm-hmm. Without a doubt. That was something uh, I remember uh, early on when we were getting contracts and things like that. And we were asked to review these things. Very complex materials. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not. We're not classically uh, trained in that. Have you had thoughts about going on and getting your JD and getting a getting a law degree? Yeah, once they cut it down to two years instead of three. <laughs> All right, hold on. We'll get a new degree <laughs> plan at the LA Post. <laughs> I hear you. I yeah. hear you, though. Uh, okay, uh, we're almost at our time here. Um, I, I, any any kind of you know additional thoughts about you know your own experiences 
you know, LA Film School, Library Recording School, your internships, where you're currently at, but any, you know, kind of just general words of wisdom. I know you've mentioned a lot, very valuable advice, but any, you know, last thoughts in terms of people who may be listening? There's a lot of vets here, right? Yes, there yeah, are. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Look for those programs. I, I use those programs that help me, like, with my resume. They threw my resume out there. I can't remember what they're all called right now. Maybe, like, Flute, something, you know. Uh, vets take care of each other, you know. And uh, keep your network strong. Like, don't burn any bridges because it's a small world if you're trying to work in the entertainment industry. Everyone knows everybody, you know. So, um, yeah, don't burn any bridges. Um, keep the grind and it'll all work out. Right. As my old, uh, one of my first mentors and boss used to say, uh, be nice all the time because you never know who you're going to be talking to. Uh, so very, very good advice. All right. So we're going to uh, pick up some questions uh, in the chat here. The first one we have here uh, is from, uh, uh, if I, I think I'm allowed to say their name. If I'm not, someone tell me, but I'll say their name. It's either Devon or Devin. Uh, can you remember any vital questions uh, that you asked your mentors is the first question. Can I see it? Oh, I can see this somewhere. Um, yeah, I think it's in the chat. Yeah. Oh, can you just repeat the question? Uh, yeah, it says, can you remember any vital questions that you ask your mentors? Any vital questions that I ask my mentor? Um, I mean, like when I got the gig before BMG and I took Ann Klein out for coffee, I asked those questions for sure. Um, and I asked her specifically, I was like, do I need a law degree? Like, should I get a law degree? Like, would that make me get into the industry easier? And she's like, no, you don't. You know, <laughs> like, she was just like, it's a who you know business, you know, like, so, and that's, that's always stuck with me. Um, other mentors. Um, uh, unless it's two years, right? Is what we said, the, yeah, the law degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, like my biggest question, I was like, do I need it? Like to even like get an entry? Like, level? I, that's like one thing I was like somewhat worried about is like, do I have the entry requirements to get like anywhere? You know, like three of my colleagues that I work with went to Harvard, you know? So like, I'm just like, do I have that Harvard degree to like, like get in the door? You know, like. I haven't um, heard of that school. Is that a famous school? Yeah. I th yeah, I think they teach music or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you actually sort of answered the next one, but we'll we'll get to it as well. It said, when you cold called the companies, what did you say? Was there a script that you kind of read from or talked about? Um, I don't know if there, I don't think like I wrote anything down prior. Um, I somewhat pride myself to be able to speak on the spot. And I think that's a good skill to have. It was mostly like I just told them my story, kept it honest. I'm just like, hey, you know, I'm a military vet trying to break into the entertainment industry. Uh, I'm looking for advice that you can possibly give me. Or like maybe when you were younger, when you were trying to break in the street, like I asked them their story, you know, and try and compare them to mine and then, you know, like connect with them. Yeah, I think that's really, really valuable. You know, uh, it's something we preach and, and, you know, in addition, obviously, general networking but also like alumni networking, veteran networking, things of that nature. And I think a super important thing to keep in mind is that not if, but when you're given that opportunity, you're grinding, you know, always keep that in mind and always give that back to someone else at some point. You know, it's something I really enjoy doing through multiple programs, mentorship, internship programs, but it's totally invaluable. And those people will help other people and they really don't ever forget about it. They're, they're, they're forever thankful about it. Uh, and it makes you feel good. It, it, it's a good thing. Uh, can you think, uh, let me read this. Can you think of TV licensing resources or websites that many people overlook? I mean, there's definitely resources out there, probably like ASCAP or BMI, like the PRO websites still teach you a lot there. I think when I got into music licensing or just like the thought of it before even school, like I was just like, what is a music supervisor? Like, what is music clearance? You know, and like, I didn't quite understand that until like I got into school, but like I already learned the buzzwords, you know, when it, when it comes down to it. So that definitely helps. But I don't think there was like a main website that I necessarily went to, but the PRO websites definitely help. And while you're talking about it, clearance, license, you know, agent manager, there's distinct differences. Agents negotiate, 
They cannot be on credits. They're they're you know uh, regulated by state laws. Managers can negotiate. Managers cannot negotiate, and but managers can produce. Along those lines, what would you say are like you know just from a learning perspective, the core differences per se are like the core things that make up uh, a licensor and then a supervisor as well for music. Uh, like a supervisor, like I don't quite understand the question actually. Just, I was wondering if you could like just kind of clarify like the roles in terms of like what each of those, you know, if, if there's a difference in terms of the roles, in terms of clearance and licensing, are they merged? Are they the same thing? But also like music supervision as well. Yeah, I mean, the music supervision side is mostly like you're given a budget and you're like, all right, I got this budget. Hey, I want to use this Nirvana song in this one scene, right? Let's say they have the budget or whatever. They would then... Uh, look up on a PRO website like ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, or whatnot. It's like find out where this writer uh, is publishing and the master is controlled for. And then they'll reach out to those companies. They'd be like, hey, I got a request for a Nirvana song. We got 20K for this scene. Here are the rights we want, you know, TV, life of copyright, et cetera, et cetera. And then we'll, then as the licensor, we'll like bring it to uh, our, the management most likely or the state in Nirvana's like case and be like, hey, here's the deal. And then we also put in our input on, hey, they offered this fee. We might think it's fair, but this composition is like one of the, you know, the greatest songs they ever written. Like, I think the fee should be here. And then we go back and forth on what we think the fee should be. And then we quote back to the licensee or the music supervisor and be like, hey, this is how much we think should cost. Negotiation back and forth we usually land somewhere, you know? Do you feel like a lot of the supervisors that you work for are kind of like in a freelance position, like it's like a gig position based on like the post-production or they actually work for a small house? You mentioned the three guys before yeah. or like a larger place. Is it all across the board or, or how does it's that both. work? It's both. It's definitely both. Um, like I work with CBS too, and that's kind of like direct with the studio. But then some CBS programs might outsource them to like another music supervision company. So it's, it's definitely both. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, different opportunities. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, what is the best way for an artist to get their songs up for consideration to a company like BMG? Um... You don't get this <laughs> one ever, right? You never get this one. I mean, I would work on your brand. Like, I'm not like a song singer songwriter like that, but if I was going to like, go in that position i wouldn't necessarily just email everything to like a and r reps or something like that because it's going to be like hidden you know like with a pile of other song requests that they get and they want to listen to the first 10 seconds anyway you know i'll just like keep on working on your craft and like in your brand and i think it'll come to light to be honest right would you would you say those are kind of like unsolicited submissions in terms of like yeah they just flat out don't they legally can't or choose not to accept it. Is that kind of what yeah. that is? I mean, there's a lot of egos involved too when it comes to A&R. Right. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, to, to, give you an, story. to give you an idea how it was on the, on the film side of things uh, and, and back in the days when we used to have these in the early 2000s, yeah. when we used to have these things called paper scripts and there was actual paper before like PDFs and final draft and stuff like that. At a large agency like CAA, uh, there was a whole actual process same way as anything else wherein if something shows up in your mailbox and it looks unsolicited we literally they literally cannot accept it they would not accept yeah. it they would repackage it and repurpose it and send it right back out because that's legalities that's protection mm -hmm. so you know i think sometimes you know emerging artists may confuse that as like you know they don't like me or it's an ego thing yeah it literally is a it is a legal thing like they yeah. can be in such tremendous hot water, uh, you know, if something like that happens. Same way, for example, uh, where, you know, uh, there's been while I was at Disney, there was multiple cases. Yeah, I, I, figured, would, you, I figured you'd go to Disney. About that, 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 <laughs> that would happen. You know, I mean, when I got to Disney, uh, we were starting we, we were starting production of Pirates of the Caribbean one. If I had a dollar for every writer that came out of the woodwork that said, hey, wait a second. Yeah. I went to Disneyland once. I went to that 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 dingy ride where everything smells like mildew called Pirates of the Caribbean. I pitched an idea and, you know, 35 years ago. What are you talking about that you're making this movie? Well, that's not the one that we bought. And, and that happens, you know, 
Yeah, uh, you have to sign everything, right? You have to sign everything yeah, and, yeah. and sign everything and, and kind of do the proper process. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a great point, though, you know, because you're coming at it from the angle of, you know, building up your brand, building up awareness and kind of it really is kind of like networking, but also like people finding you mm-hmm. and then getting access to the label and, and yeah. kind of doing it uh, that way. Yeah. Um, Following. They, they look at that stuff. They look at social media numbers and stuff these days, to be honest. Right. Right. Now, uh, I don't think uh, we'll, we'll do a last call for, for any other uh, questions here. I'm just kind of curious. What's one of the biggest artists or acts that either is incredibly, if you're able to say, you may not be able to say it, but you know, isn't really, doesn't really license a lot of their stuff or give permission. I mean, there was a few outliers, but are there still some out there like old school rock and roll bands? hundred percent. I'm not going to name the bands. Sure. But yeah. there are huge bands out there that like make million dollars of sinks like every year and they turn down like million dollar ad deals. You know, My, mind blowing, isn't it? Yeah. I'm just like looking at it. I was like, you, you turn down this deal. It's free money. You know, like, but it is like that. Yeah. I, I grew up, I'm a huge fan of the Beastie Boys. And uh, they mentioned this, you know, I was watching something not too long ago. This is something they always said collectively they wouldn't do. They wouldn't license a lot of their stuff. And it's, you know, look, it's an it's a, it's not an integrity thing. It's it's an artist thing. It's it's something you can totally do. You just have to be aware of the fact that, you know, if you don't do these things, like you potentially could be losing, you know, opportunities. But, you know, like you said, some bands make uh you know, hundred million. So what's, you know, one, one million less a yeah. lot to us, but you know, mm-hmm. they're in a different uh, environment. So yeah, it's uh, shocking. it is shocking. It is mm-hmm. shocking. Uh, I think we've got one last question here um, from AJ on YouTube. Do you have any suggestions for sync licensing video game soundtracks? Um, so I work like I was covering for a colleague of mine. So I've been working on an EA for the last month and those like, those like video game soundtrack stuff, I, I think you need to get signed to a publisher, to be honest. You're not going to, I mean, like, unless like it's a song that blew up on TikTok or something like that, and they're, they're reaching out, but, you know, they have plenty of music to choose from, from all the like the majors and the labels out there where they're, everyone's throwing music at them. So yeah, you probably get signed or blow up on TikTok, to be honest. Right. And <laughs> as it currently exists, and I'm probably behind on this, but you know, BMG, for example, do, do they have like current existing relationships with social media platforms in terms of licensing and things of that nature for the most yeah. part? Right. Yeah, we do. Um, some of it's gray area still. Right. I comment on. <laughs> right. Sure. No. I, yeah. It's tr- it's yeah. tricky. It's certainly tricky, you know, without mm-hmm. a doubt, without a doubt. Um, OK, what? Let's see here. Just a couple more. Uh, one more question, from Devin, if we have time. OK. When finding up and coming films and projects. Do you keep an eye out for any media sources uh, such as I, I, I think this is related to that. They mentioned such as Billboard Pro, IMDb Pro, et cetera. So I'll repeat it. When finding up and coming films and projects, do you keep an eye out for any media sources such as Billboard Pro, IMDb Pro? Well, so I don't look out. I don't go looking for those projects like those projects come to me. So it's kind of different. But those are amazing resources to use. Um, but yeah, so like if I get a project, I'm gonna look it up on IMDb, see how legit it is. Because like sometimes they come to me with like, oh, this is an indie movie. We have no money. And then I see the actors in it and I'm like, Tom Cruise is in it. This is not an indie movie, you know? So like <laughs> I fact check things, you know? But yeah, I don't go out looking for music or film projects, but I do fact check them using those resources. Right. And do yeah. you ever get into an environment where like, for example, a legit indie project, no Tom Cruise, mm-hmm. uh, they reach out and you know companies will kind of do them a solid you know or like clients will agree like okay we'll let them have it type of thing at like a reduced rate does that does that ever happen yeah i mean we understand like sometimes like documentaries and stuff like that don't have you know the fast and the furious budget and whatnot and like you know and sometimes we're like how you know is this how visible is this really going to be you know like so we're not like charging thirty thousand dollars for like in small indie student film and like fast and the furious you know there's a there's in between for sure and the fascinating thing to me about this will always be that you know we're we're talking about visual mediums combined with you know music in general and and what that experience is like 
how integral they are not only to the process, but to the final artistic project in terms of like, for example, you know, what would certain movies be without needle drops or what would certain movies be without original music? So, you know, it, it's fascinating to me because it's so intertwined to all these great shows, for example, on Netflix, which are driving up sales for, you know, no offense, dead artists, artists who've been, you know, haven't been doing anything for 35, 40 years. And it's, it's really, really important. to them. So, uh, well, good stuff. Uh, okay. Well, I think we are going to wrap up here. Uh, Alan, you know, again, we really, really do appreciate your time, your insight. You know, I know you're you're a very, very busy person, so we do appreciate that 100%. Uh, so on behalf of the school, the Recording School, LA Film School, Entertainment Business, everyone watching at home, we really do appreciate your time and thank you so much. Any, any last thoughts or anything with regards to uh, your experience or anything to share whatsoever? Um, just keep grinding. You know, the opportunity is going to be there. Sometimes you're going to have to pivot, you know, but you know, it's a, it's a fun industry for sure. Enjoy it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And, uh, and uh, also put in the chat, uh, our veterans and our students appreciate the advice. So uh, thank you so hey, much. I know so, guy. There's guy. <laughs> he's on campus right now. Yeah, he's right a good, on. he's a great guy. He's yeah, a great yes, guy. <laughs> there, there you go. Uh, we actually have Alan, just so you know, we have a few uh, uh, of our entertainment business. Our classes are literally on campus right now. Nice. Uh, so they're watching you as well. So uh, right. Guy, a Alan says hello to you. So there you go. Yeah, I took his class. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Have a great uh, rest of your night, a good weekend, all that stuff. And uh, we appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Right, Have a good care. one. All right. Bye, everyone.